Any, uh, any baseball fans out there? One person. All right, good. <laughs> One baseball fan, okay. Well, this, this, uh, this story is gonna be really boring for a lot of you then, all right. But uh, I love baseball, I, I do, I love baseball. When I was a kid, um, the Pittsburgh Pirates minor league double A team came to Altoona, Pennsylvania. And Altoona is like 30 minutes away from where I grew up. So it was really cool, a new minor league team come in. I think it was like 2000, I was like, uh, what would I have been, fourth, fifth grade, something like that. But um, the Horseshoe Curve, if you've ever heard of it, probably not, but it's a, uh, it's a railroad landmark in Altoona. It's this train track that literally like goes around the mountain in the shape of a horseshoe. It's pretty cool. So that's why they named it the Altoona Curve, the team, the Altoona Curve. And I love going to curve games. You know, as a kid, it was really cool to watch the players go through the minor leagues, see if anyone would make it to the major leagues, you know? So I was just a kid, so, you know, you'd want to get all these autographs, just in case somebody made it big, you know, but unfortunately it was the Pittsburgh Pirates, so nobody ever made it big. So all those balls of autographs that I have, a total waste, I don't even know where they are anymore. But um, going, uh, going to opening day, though, was the best. Opening day. There's nothing like opening day baseball. It was, it was a predictable day. And no matter how much life changed the year before, it's like, ah, it's time for opening day. It's like familiar, it's comforting. It's like that old sweatshirt you have in your closet that you put on, you know, it's, it's nice. And then when I went to college, I was like 40 minutes away from Pittsburgh. So Gwen and I, and, and Justin, wherever he is, we would always go to a, uh, we would try to go to opening day um, for the Pirates. Um, it, it was really great. And nothing better than PNC Park, the Pirates, Opening day, it was really great. And um, so whether it was the Altoona Curve or the Pittsburgh Pirates, opening day baseball, it evoked like the same kind of emotion. I don't know, it was like comforting. It was, it was, it was peaceful. And I think it's because baseball is just a constant thing in an ever-changing world. You ever see Field of Dreams? That's what James Earl Jones, that's what he says about Baseball, he says, people will come, Ray. The one constant through all the years has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It has been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again, but baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, it's a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good and could be again. Whether or not you're a baseball fan, hopefully you can at least somewhat relate to this quote. These, these constant things in life, they, they bring us a certain level of peace, a certain level of comfort in an ever-changing world. Gwen and I, we got to go to the Masters a few weeks ago. It was awesome, golf tournament, just a practice round, that's all we want. But um, we got to still, we got to go there. And uh, if you're unfamiliar, the Masters is a golf tournament. Um, it's at the same course, Augusta National. It's been played every year, just about every year, since 1934. So just stepping on this course that has you know, hosted so many tournaments and had so many memories, it was, it was amazing. It was like taking a step back in time. It's, it's timeless. It's another one of those constant things that is just always there in an ever-changing world. And what's really cool is at the Masters, they actually try to keep the concession prices as close to the same as the originals as possible. So like, you can get a sandwich for like $1.50. Yeah, it's true. It's true. You can get a drink for like two bucks. Like how much is that cookie? Usually you go to like, you know, a sporting event like peanuts, $8 or something, you know. The Masters is like, I have 50 cents. Go ahead and have your peanuts, you know. It's, it's great. The point is, it's, it's really cool. But whatever it is for you, you know, baseball, the Masters, maybe it's another kind of event or a family tradition, you know, whatever it is. Point is, the constants of life bring us a certain level of peace in an ever-changing world, don't they? These constant things in life. I think, looking back, that's one of the reasons why COVID was so hard for so many people. It's because it wiped out a lot of those constant things in life that we, we really looked forward to and kind of marked the time by. You know, It wasn't right that April came and there was no masters or no opening day baseball. 
The one constant through all the years has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again, but baseball has marked the time. Whatever it is for you, those constant things in life, they bring a certain level of peace to an ever-changing world. Now, the title of the message today is The One Constant. The One Constant. So go ahead, turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2. This is part two of our series, God of Miracles, about the life of Elisha. Okay, so last week, if you remember Easter Sunday, who had a good time here last week, Easter Sunday? Wow. That was wild, man. I mean, we had an orchestra. You know, this group, I mean, I hadn't played my saxophone in like eight years, and neither had a lot of the people up there. You know, they were all people right here from the church. Isn't that cool? And we just dusted off the horns, and man, it sounded, sounded so good, didn't it? I mean, what, it, the whole thing, it was just an amazing celebration. And last week, we started at the end of the life of Elisha. If you remember the story, he was literally dead. And a man was thrown on his bones, on Elisha's bones, and then just got up and was raised to life again. So we started last week at the very, very end of Elisha's life. He was literally dead in a tomb. So this week, we're going to rewind all the way back and go back to the beginning. So 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah, now, I don't know why God has done this, but two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, it's like, sorry if it sounds the same, but I'll do my best, okay? Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know, keep quiet. Elisha said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as long as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho draw near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it, keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. 50 men of the sons of prophets also went and stood at some distance from him, and as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted on the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am going to be taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if you do not see me, it shall not be so. Oh, you ready to dig in today? Because, uh, you know, there's a lot here. We're gonna go a little deep, and then it's all gonna make sense at the, uh, at the end, so I really want you to pay attention, let's all work a little harder, focus, and it's gonna pay off at the end, okay? Now next time we're gonna uh, look at you know, the significance of these places, you know, they mentioned Bethel and Gilgal and Jericho, and there is a significance about these places, but I wanna start today with what Elijah said in verse nine. So Elijah's about to be taken up into heaven, and before he goes, he asks Elijah, he says, you know what? What can I do for you? And Elisha responds, he asks for, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. What does this mean? He's like, hey man, hey, thanks for asking. And uh, you were a really great prophet. I mean, you were cool, it was cool, but I wanna be two times better than you. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Now, that's really not what he's saying. What, what does this mean, a double portion? Well, a lot of people point to the fact that, you know, if you tally it, actually, Elisha did about twice as many miracles as Elijah. And actually, Elisha's ministry lasted about twice as long 
as Elijah's ministry. But when Elisha here is asking for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, that really wasn't actually what he was going for or asking for. In the Old Testament, okay, the oldest son had a right to a double portion of his father's property. That's how they did it back then, okay? So each heir had a share of the father's inheritance, but the firstborn son would get a double share. So when Elisha, he asked for a double portion, he's actually asking to be Elijah's firstborn son in a spiritual sense, okay? He was asking to inherit Elijah's ministry. That's what he was asking to do. He was asking to become his heir or successor. But here's the interesting thing about that. He was already called to be Elijah's successor. Let's look back at 1 Kings chapter 19. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, uh, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And look, Elisha, the son of Saphat of Abel Meholai, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Saphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, which signified that he was going to be his successor. Okay? So this was already a known deal. So we get to 2 Kings chapter 2, when Elisha asked Elisha to be his successor, he's not really asking for anything new, he's simply asking for the promise to now come to completion. Isn't that important for us? You know, we don't have to ask for anything new. God has already promised us everything that we need. That's why he says, ask, and it will be given to you. It doesn't mean, you know, go ask for a Lamborghini to be in my parking lot the next day, although that would be nice, by the way. But, um, <laughs> but that's not what it, asking and receiving means. It's asking within the realm of what is God has already promised you. Because I don't think we realize how much God has promised us and how abundant those promises are toward us. So read the scriptures, see what God has promised you, and ask Ask for those promises to be given. That's essentially what Elisha is doing here, asking for the promise that he's already been promised to take place. Now, I want you to notice how Elijah then responds to his request. Look at verse 10. And he, Elisha, he said, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. So, You know, Elijah says, I want a double portion. Elijah says, well, you have asked a hard thing. What's he talking about? Well, here's what he's saying. He's saying, letting you inherit a double portion of my spirit. In other words, as we said, you becoming the heir of the ministry. it's It's a hard thing because it's not up to me. It's not, it's not my mantle to pass. I wasn't given this mantle because of my own effort. I was given it because God gave it to me. So God's gonna have to give it to you now, next. It's not yours. I think that's what we gotta remember, right? No, it's it's not ours. It's God's business. This church isn't mine. It's God's. Church isn't ours, it's God's. God's in control. God decides. God's the one who will endow Elisha with the right to be the successor to Elijah. And that's what Elisha is saying. He's saying, you've asked a hard thing. It's not mine to give it away. Yet, here's how you know if your request has been granted. He says, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. So that is how Elisha knows that he's received this double portion, that he has become the successor to Elisha, if he sees Elisha being taken up into heaven. And as we see next, he did see it. Verse 11, and as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elisha went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, there it is, he saw it. 
And he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his clothes and tore them into pieces. Now, I wanna take a little side trail and explain to you what exactly Elisha saw here. So Elisha saw, he literally witnessed Elisha being taken up by a whirlwind into heaven. Other translations use the term ascended or raptured into heaven. I mean, he, just, he just went right up into heaven. I mean, was, wow. I mean, this is reminiscent of what happened. There's just one little verse in Genesis. It seems like the same thing happened to this dude named Enoch. Genesis 5, 24. And in reverent fear and obedience, Enoch walked with God, and he was not found among men because God took him away to be home with him. How cool is that? Amen. You're just walking along and poof, he's in heaven. I mean, that's really cool. <laughs> And if you think that's cool, you know what? What happened to Enoch and what happened to Elisha is not some far out story. It's a glimpse of what will happen to you, to all who are in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And look, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. This is not just some far out story of myth or something like that. This is literally a foreshadowing of what awaits all who are in Christ. We will be caught up together with them in the air. So cool. Or as the words of the well-known spiritual say, it says, I looked over the Jordan and what did I see coming for to carry me home? A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. It's the promise that awaits all who are in Christ Jesus. And that is what Elisha saw. He saw a foreshadowing of what is to come for all who are in Christ. Now, all right, back to the story. Remember, Elijah, seeing this event unfold was a confirmation that he did indeed inherit the double portion, that he was indeed the successor. So he saw it, so the double portion is indeed his, all right? Everyone good so far? Everyone tracking? We good? We got one more thing to go through before it all comes together, and it's gonna be really cool. It's like that movie, you watch at the end when, you know, all these things are happening. You're like, what's going on with this movie? This is what's going on. And at the end, you're like, oh, wow, this makes sense, you know? So that's coming. All right. One more thing. This is important. Bring it. <laughs> oh, I'm about to. Yeah. <laughs> Elisha saw this event unfold, right? We just saw that. But others didn't, okay? I want to skip ahead a few verses and show you some others who didn't see it and how they reacted to Elijah's absence. These others, they didn't see it, okay? Verse 16, and they, these others said to him, behold now, there are with your servants 50 strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It's like we need to go find this guy, where'd he go? It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. There's like, you know, did he just pop onto a mountain somewhere and go send a look for him? Where'd he go? And Elisha said, you shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. It's like what I do with my kids. Okay, fine. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it. It's not going to work. You know, that's what Elisha does. And for three days they sought him but did not find him, <laughs> duh. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Right. So others, these, these other people, they're, they're actually, verse 15, it, it calls them sons or, or um, followers of the prophets. So they would have followed these prophets around. They, they were the sons of prophets. They, they followed Elijah and Elisha. These others, they, they came to Elisha, and they asked, hey, we got like 50 guys here. They're ready to go. Let's, go, let's send them to go look for Elijah. We got to find him. You know, maybe he's on a mountain. Maybe he's on a valley. Let's go find Elijah. But Elijah's like, hey, what are you going to, you're not going to find him. 
he saw Elijah being taken up in heaven. He knew where he was. They weren't going to find him. The other persists. He says, you know, fine, knock yourselves out. Go look for him. And of course, they come back, and Elijah says, I told you, you weren't going to find them. So here's where this thing comes full circle. Okay. So let's summarize. I want you to get this. As the chapter begins, right, we see Elijah, it was a known thing. He was going to be taken up into heaven. Verse 1, it started that way. But before he goes, he asks Elijah, what do you want? Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want to inherit your ministry, be his successor. Elisha says, well, it's going to be tough because it's not mine to give. But if you see me taken up into heaven, then you'll know that you've received it. The key question in the story is, why? Why was seeing Elijah being taken up into heaven the indicator of whether Elisha would succeed Elijah or not. Why was this the deal, right? Why was Elisha seeing that the indicator of it? Watch this. These other sons of prophets, these other people who didn't succeed Elijah, these, these other people, the sons of the prophets who didn't see Elisha being taken up into heaven, here's the point. Who are they looking for? Who did they want to find? Elijah. Where'd he go? Oh, where's Elijah? We gotta go look for him. Where, where'd he go? Maybe he's on a mountain, maybe he's in a valley, but we gotta go see him. We gotta go, we gotta go look for him. They wanted Elijah back. Those who didn't see Elijah being taken up in heaven, they were still looking for Elijah. But since Elisha saw Elijah being taken up into heaven, who did he look for? Who did he seek after? And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, look, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Seeing Elijah being taken up into heaven, I believe actually was the thing that equipped Elisha for his ministry. Because in seeing that, in seeing those chariots and, and the horses, it wouldn't be the first time he'd see them, but in seeing the chariots and the horses take Elisha up in the world when he learned that he would have to not seek after the seen, but he'd have to learn to seek after the unseen. After he saw it, after he saw this event unfold, what did Elisha say? He says, where is the Lord? Where is he? Where's the God of Elisha? Not Elisha. Where is the God of Elisha? I wonder today, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? What are you looking for? We get so obsessed seeking after Elisha's. Seeking after what we can see. Amen. What we can see right in front of us. Where's Elijah? Where, where'd he go? Where did... But the question I have for you today is, are you able to see beyond what's in front of you? Amen. So we get so obsessed with seeking after Elijah's. We got to find him. We need to see him. We need to find him. And then we find hope in what we can tangibly see. So maybe for you, maybe for me, it's another person. Maybe it's a celebrity that you've idolized or, or an inspiring figure. Maybe it's a certain ministry or program. Maybe it's a social justice issue. Maybe it's a return to an age gone by. Or maybe it's the new trend of the age that we see. We put all of our hope in these things that we can see. Maybe it's politics or a, a political issue going a, a certain way or a, a political agenda, whatever it is. We seek after these things that we can see. Oh, where's Elijah? Where's Elijah? And we seek after those things that we can see because we've put our hope Amen. in them. Amen. But are you able today to seek beyond the visible Elijahs in front of you? Because... All of those Elijahs that I just mentioned, you know, people, politics, certain trends, 
eras, all those things, you know what they all have in common? They all come and go. They all come and go. Elijah, even Elijah, the great prophet Elijah, who called down fire from heaven, even he had his time. And Elijah was gone. None of the things that we can see in life are constant. None. They're all transient. They're all fading away. So why do we keep going to those things and putting our hope in them? They're all fading away. They're all going away. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what, we, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So who are you looking for? Do you constantly need to look for the seen? Where's Elijah? Maybe he's on a mountain. Maybe he's in a valley. Need to find him. Or do you rest? And do you look for the things that are unseen? The constant things that lie behind all of the transient things that are just fading away. Let me read that again. And he took up the cloak of Elisha that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elisha that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where is the Lord? Man, isn't that a great way to live? You know, not where's this, where's that, where's the Lord? No, no. Where is the Lord? The God of Elisha. Every situation, where is the Lord? The God of Elisha. Every day, where is the Lord? The God of Elisha. I got to find him. That's all I need to find. Where is the Lord? The God of Elisha. Where is the Lord? The God of Elisha. That's who we need to look for. Because that will never fade away. And then when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. Wow. Now, do you know that this was the Jordan River, right? This, this, uh, that's what he struck the waters where they were. But this wasn't the first time that the Jordan River was parted. Let's rewind back to the book of Joshua, hundreds of years before. Joshua chapter 3. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. It happened before. It happened again. I think because God really wants us to get this. He is the one constant. You know, all these other things, they, they, they all fade away. But what is unseen is eternal. Amen. He's always there. Listen to this quote. It's so good. The God of 1400 BC, that's when, the, that's when Joshua parted the Jordan River before. The God of 1400 BC is just as mighty as the God of 850 BC when Elisha and Elisha crossed the Jordan River. And guess what, church? He's just as mighty as the God of 2023. He's the same God. He's the same God. He is constant. Imagine how folks in Elisha's day might claim that they lived in a different time. We do that all the time, too. We put excuses. Oh, well, it's, it's different now. God's not, though. Amen. It's not. It was, after all, you know, the Iron Age. Perhaps they could say that they faced different cultural problems. 
problems, that, they, that the world political configurations had changed drastically. But the text says it doesn't matter because the God of the Bronze Age is the same in the Iron Age, no matter how new it may seem. Nor should this point be wasted on us. Listen, God is still saving and sanctifying his people. Amen. He is still keeping them from the evil one. And the Holy Spirit is still leading wandering Christians to repent and renew their obedience. These works are not limited to Pentecost or to the Reformation Amen. or to the 18th century revivals. The historical God is also the contemporary God. It's the same God. God is not tied to a person. He's not tied to an era. For every Elisha, there's an Elisha. For every Moses, there's a Joshua. For David, there's a Solomon. And for every Paul, there's a Timothy. He's not tied to a person or an age. Elisha's will come and go. What we see in front of us will come and go because it's, it's temporary, it's fading away, and it will change. But God doesn't ever change. He is the one constant through it all. Sure, baseball has marked our time, and it is a constant in our lives in a certain way. But how much more do we have a constant in the God who loves us? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Elijah's change. What we see will change. You know, how much has changed for you already? It changed. Leaders change. People change. Times change. Eras change. Circumstances change. Methods change. Culture changes. The way we do things changes. The, the way we live life changes. It, it changes. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the one constant. Elisha may be gone. He was gone. But Elisha knew it wasn't about Elijah. As long as he had Elijah's spirit, the Holy Spirit of God inside of him, all things were possible. He didn't need Elijah. He needed the God of Elijah. Then he took the cloak of Elisha that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where's the Lord, the God of Elijah? Maybe, maybe that's the question that you're asking today. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where, where is he, where is he? And look what verse 14 has for you. And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other and Elijah went over. God parted the Jordan for Joshua, parted the Jordan for Elijah and Elisha, and he still parts the waters today for you, for you. Because he's the same God. He's the same God. He's right here. He's, he's with us. He hasn't left. He hasn't changed. Amen. What we see in front of us is temporary and it, it, it changes. But God doesn't change. He's the one constant. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Moses. He's the God of Joshua. He's the God of Elijah and Elisha. He's the God of David. He's the God of Solomon. He's the God of Mary. He's the gospel of Peter and Paul and Timothy. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. It's the same God. The God that called Abraham, the God that called him to sacrifice his only son, 
the God of Jacob who blessed the nations, the God of Moses who led his people out of Israel, the God of Joshua who knocked the walls of Jericho down, the God of Mary who gave birth to Jesus, the God of Peter, the God of Paul who started the church. It's the same God. It's the same God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the one constant. And no matter where you are today, no matter how life has changed and it maybe is even tumultuous, today, you can take that cloak and you can bend down. You can bend down to the bank of the room and put your cloak in it and watch those waters part. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He's right here, right in front of you. He's right there, it's the same God. You wanna know where he is? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. So as we end our service today, I want you to just bend down on the bank of the Jordan River. And I want you to put your cloak in the water and ask that same question that Elijah asked. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And then I want you to look up and I want you to see those waters part right in front of you because he's there. He is with you. He doesn't change. He's the same God. God, I pray that as we seek you today, as we bend down, as we seek after your presence, God, make yourself known to us today. Would you part the waters that lie in front of us? God, when we seek you, we know that you will answer us. We know that you are a God who is not far off, but a God who is very near, that brings us comfort. And it has brought his people comfort all through the ages. You've been the one constant through it all, through all the tumultuous events of human history, through all of humanity's failures, through all of our suffering and pain and grief. God, you are the one constant in our lives. You are there, ever there, ever present, never changing, never fading away. What we see is all fading away, but God, what is unseen, that spiritual realm that you are in charge of, it is eternal. And so God, as we bend down today, And as we seek you today, God, would you make your presence known to us? Would we feel your presence? And would we know, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We give you all the praise today for who you are and what a mighty God you are. A God who is the same and never changing. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of Joshua, the God of Elisha, the God of Elisha, the God of David, the God of Solomon, the God of Isaiah and Ezekiel and of Daniel, the God of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Mary and Peter and Timothy, the God of John, the God of your people, the God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're the same God and we give you all the praise today. And all of God's people said, amen. Let's seek after him. Come on.